Deputy Speaker, before I start, I want to add my tribute to the many others, uh, uh, to Keith Palmer, who lost his life protecting us, and to his colleagues who went straight back to work protecting us. Our thoughts are with all those injured and bereaved in the incident last Wednesday, and our gratitude goes to those in the emergency services and the many others who responded so quickly. It was also helpful to get messages of condolence and support from our faith leaders, including our local Muslim leaders. Madam Deputy Speaker, it's almost two years since I was elected to this House. It's been an honour, sometimes hugely rewarding, but too often not a pleasure. Sadly, Madam Deputy Speaker, too much of what I've had to deal with on behalf of my constituents has been the impacts on them and their families as a result of the deliberate decisions of this government. I and my small and overstretched team have dealt with over 20,000 requests for help and support in the last 22 months. Whilst many are seeking my views on everything from Brexit to animal welfare, there is a very large and growing number of who turn to me because they just don't know what to do to get the change they so badly need. This could be the very many people dependent on council and other services or on disability or bereavement benefits that are being withdrawn or rationed because of government funding cuts. In the short time I have available, I'm going to touch on some other local examples that to me illustrate the lack of interest or compassion the government has for my constituents and people across the country. But firstly, I, I was wondering, why does this government hold children in such low regard? Children who've lost a mother or father and the family are going to lose bereavement benefits. Third and subsequent children and a family benefiting from tax credits who are no longer going to be uh, entitled to that additional benefit that those additional children need. Children in school just, uh, whose, whose school is going to be cut is already facing cuts and will be cut further when the national funding formula comes in. All of those above are just some of those affected by this government's policies. Madam Deputy Speaker, the Prime Minister started her term of office by expressing concern for the just about managing and how they worry about paying the mortgage. Well, in my constituency in West London, most people not already on the housing ladder worry about paying the rent. And having a mortgage is a distant and an unlikely dream when the average sale price is two and a half times the average salary. The rent of a modest two-bedroom flat in Isleworth, in the middle of my constituency, for instance, costs three quarters of the take-home pay of an average Heathrow worker or even of a teacher. And being considered adequately housed, a family like that, having to any hope of getting a council house or a, family, or a housing association flat. The income of those constituents is way below those needed for any of the so-called affordable housing schemes promoted by this government, shared ownership, starter home or 80% market rental. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'd now like to move on to the confluence of policy and bureaucracy, starting with the rollout of universal credit. For those of my constituents on low incomes or unable to work at all, universal credit has been torture. On top of the punishment of ever lowered benefit caps and the cutting foot back of support for people with disabilities and long term health conditions. I don't know, I don't know if this co government is consciously driving through the enforced destitution of those on low incomes without, uh, um, uh, without any benefit or, slightly, uh, or some benefit slightly better off families uh, can, uh, can fall back on. Or whether civil service cuts mean there's just no one to implement the system properly. But what it means for claimants is having no money at all for weeks. Or if that family are working, having enough to buy food, but worrying if the money they're due for their rent will ever come through. And the sheer bureaucratic mess. One form was on its 54th iteration when we last look at it, looked at it. Crazy man bureaucracy led by mendacious policies sadly aren't confined to the DWP in my experience as a member of this House. Over 40% of my constituents were born overseas and I've lost count of the number of people in my weekly advice surgeries telling me that their application to the Home Office has been turned down without the Home Office staff even looking at their paperwork. Such as the woman whose application was refused on only one count of the many that she passed. She was told it was because she had failed her English test despite the fact that her certificate stating she had passed English with distinction was right there as part of her application, or the French citizen whose application for UK citizenship was refused because she failed the test of permanent residency. Why? Because she'd had the temerity to go on a two-day break 
abroad exactly three years to the day before the date of her citizenship application. Both of these cases illustrate how those affected and their families feel that their victims of the net immigration pledge down to 100,000 rule dreamt up by the PM <coughs> when she was Home Secretary. And that last example leads me on to Brexit. I supported Remain, and 60% of my constituents agreed with me because of what it means to their family, their work, their business, or their hopes and aspirations for the UK. And for many, it is personal. That French national I mentioned, whose family had a referendum vote, but she didn't herself. She's worried for her future. She's now retired, but she's lived here and paid taxes continuously for 30 years, married a UK citizen, and has two UK children. So she's applied for UK citizenship. She would never wanted to do that before, but because she is among the three million others who've been given no assurance that she can stay here and claim the pension and, if needed, the social and health care support that she's paid for for all her working life in the UK. And, of course, she won't be eligible for any of that support if she's forced <coughs> to return to France. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, I want to finish my speech by mentioning the concern of our communities of the impact of the third runway at Heathrow. Heathrow is the major driver to our local economy and is vitally important to UK PLC and will continue to be. But until we develop glider passenger planes, expansion of Heathrow means more noise for many more people, 300,000 people in and around London. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, may I conclude by wishing you and all members and staff of this House a peaceful and happy <coughs> Easter recess. And I hope, Madam Deputy Speaker, you will accept my apologies too for having to leave before the uh, wind-up speeches as I now need to leave uh, to chair a community meeting about station overcrowding. Thank you very much. Bob Stewart. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker.